this might be a quick one. What aspect of women's health is the least studied slash understood? Hmm. Was that a high scoring question? It was. You wouldn't be asking it this early in the podcast if it wasn't. Um, So ironic that I would be asked that question given that I'm um, not particularly knowledgeable in this subject and I hope I don't represent that I am. Um, I do have a number of women patients. I would say a quarter to a third of my patients are female. Um, But when you start to talk about things that are uniquely female, a couple of things come to mind. So I guess what I'm going to do is not answer this question because I don't know the answer, but just... uh, go off a little bit and hopefully something I say is of value to the people who answer this question. Obviously the most important distinction between men and women are the sex hormones. That's an enormous difference. And the other difference that comes along with that is that men experience a much more gradual decline in their sex hormones. And as such, it's often harder to appreciate symptomatic changes in men. You got a guy who's you know, walking around with this testosterone, two standard deviations below the mean, he can actually feel pretty reasonable because, you know, just like a frog who's been in water that's been slowly getting warmer, he doesn't actually realize how hot the water is because he's been in there the whole time. Whereas if you dropped him in that water overnight, it would be pretty stark. Conversely, women experience two completely, you know, you know, again, I'm just completely empathetic to what women go through, which is during their menstrual uh, cycle or, or during their, you know, uh, reproductive years, they have a menstrual cycle, which even over the course of 30 days or so, 28 to 31 days on average, um, they're experiencing profound fluctuations in their hormones. And this is another one of my favorite whiteboard topics. And, um, you know, I remember uh, there was this one patient, I'll never forget, she was, I, I was, I remember sitting down with her in her living room, actually drawing this out for her. And explaining to her why she has PMS, because her chief complaint actually, which I thought was an odd reason to come to see me because I'm, I don't think like I offer any genius expertise on this, but I mean, mostly it was just to help control her, her, her emotional swings during her cycle. And when I actually drew for her the time course of here are the, you know, here's day one, the day your period starts, here's day one of your next cycle, Here's how your FSH, your follicle stimulating hormone, your LH, your luteinizing hormone, your estradiol, your progesterone, and your testosterone vary throughout that. And let's highlight what's happening on about day 22 to 28, which is when you have this drop in progesterone. And explaining to her that for some women, that central, meaning in the in the brain, that reduction, that withdrawal of progesterone can create emotional lability and other things. And it's like, you're not crazy. Like that's 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 like saying like someone who's depressed because they don't have enough serotonin is crazy. No, I mean, it's just everyone has different neurotransmitters and everyone has a different response to hormones. So, I mean, it was a very profound thing for her. She's mm. like, oh my God, like I've always just thought I was kind of crazy and I'm just like a moody bitch. And I was like, no, I mean, and your mom went through the same thing. Your sister goes through the same thing. I mean, this is hereditary. Um, and here are two things that you can do about trying to control this. Um, Again, I don't want to get off on the tangent and go what those two things are that we talked about, but nevertheless, there were so so that's so that's during a woman's reproductive years. The second thing that's really profound is, you know, by the time a woman is in her fifth decade, typically, all of a sudden that stuff gets shut down. So all of a sudden she's losing estrogen, she's losing progesterone, and she's losing testosterone. And I include that last one because most people mm. forget about it. So when 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 you talk about the distinguishing characteristics between men and women. We usually think about testosterone being the male phenotype describing hormone, estrogen and progesterone being uh, the female dominant hormones. And that's true. But what most people don't realize is when you actually convert the units to the same numbers, so when you go from nanograms per deciliter and picograms per milliliter, which they're often reported in different units, and you do an apples to apples view, when you look at a woman's highest estrogen level in her life, which, I mean, outside of pregnancy is during her ovulatory cycle. So when she's ovulating, when she has that burst of estrogen, if you take that estrogen level and compare it to her testosterone level on average, which is testosterone varies a little bit by cycle, but not enormously, the testosterone is about 10 times higher than the estrogen. Hmm. Now, the number never looks that way because testosterone is reported typically in nanograms per deciliter, whereas the estrogen is reported usually in picograms per milliliter. But if you, you know, do like the high school, you know, calculation of what your chemistry teacher would have you do and put them both in the same units, 
you'll realize that testosterone is much higher. So even though a woman's testosterone level is much less than a man's testosterone level, a free testosterone for a woman, for, in a woman might be one nanogram per deciliter, whereas in a man, the 50th percentile would be about 14 nanograms per deciliter. So call it 14, 15 times higher. It is still a very dominant hormone even relative to estrogen. So when all three of those hormones are basically taken away in a period of two to three years, um, I don't want to get too far on the soapbox, but like definitely top 10 pet peeves are maybe top five pet peeves are doctors that completely disregard um, menopausal, perimenopausal and postmenopausal symptoms in women and who without having ever even read a single study or tried to understand the limits and the methodologies um, of the Women's Health Initiative, come to the conclusion, well, no woman should ever take hormones and they should just, you know, deal with their postmenopausal hot flashes and, and um, perimenopausal symptoms and eventually, you know, let them lose their muscle mass and bone density mm. because God forbid hormones cause cancer or some other equally knuckleheaded conclusion. Um, so those are, those are really two huge things. I think a third thing that I've seen, and I, I got to be honest, I'm kind of lazy. I don't think I've seen this in the literature and I haven't probably made a strong enough effort to look at it, but empirically it is so overwhelming that I would be surprised if it's not described in the literature is there's something about multiple pregnancies and the um, HPA axis in women. So I usually don't mm. see it after a woman has had two kids, but usually if a woman has had three or four kids, the likelihood that her thyroid bounces back to normal seems not that high. Mm. Um, and so, uh, I've, I have a couple of patients who came into the practice again, interested in longevity, but the, the, their proximate issue of concern was, you know, ever since, you know, two years ago when I had my third child or my fourth child, I have not been able to get back to the same level of energy that I once had. And you look at them and they have a normal TSH typically, um, but, but usually their peripheral metabolism of T4 is, is very altered. And, and these are, I think in some ways, like kind of the easiest saves, like you, in a very short period of time, you can make a patient feel a hell of a lot better. Um, and, and they're just, they're, they sort of fall through the cracks. And again, I think it might come down to just a failure to appreciate some of the, the these subtle differences between men and women. Again, men aren't giving birth, fortunately, or else our species would have died and we wouldn't have a species if you and I were responsible for procreation. Um, trying to think what else are fundamental differences. I mean, there are many others. Um, God. Well, part of the question is um, least studied yeah. or understood. Um, I think it was a Freakonomics podcast. They talked about this a little bit where there was, a, there was the thalidomide mm -hmm. issue. And I believe there were... I think they were maybe doing studies or something where women were involved and obviously birth defects and horrible things happened. And they sort of took women virtually off the table in terms of studying. And so there was a long period of time where it was, I think men were predominantly being studied. And we the just, subjects of, yeah. Yeah. We would just sort of assume that's whatever is we, we see in the men, we might see in the women. Um, but I think there's been, a, a, as far as epidemiology goes, there's been a resurgence in uh, women's studies and things like that. But I do think that there's overall they've been understudied just in that regard as well just looking at the female body versus the male body instead of just assuming you know they're they're the same yep um that's that's a great example i, I remember that I, that's i i remember hearing that and thinking god that's i mean everybody knows the story about thalidomide yeah you can't get through med school without it but it's the ramifications of that it's that it's that what happened as a result of that that's a very interesting point um you know, another difference between men and women, I don't know how well it's been studied, but I mean, most epidemiologic assessments would make a, a clear case that women, all things equal, tend to get less cardiovascular disease. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know how eloquently these studies have been done, mm -hmm. and I don't know if they've been normalized for ApoB in addition to LDLC. My guess is they may not have been. But nevertheless, if you were to make the assumption that once, you, that, once that analysis is done, if all things equal, inclusive of ApoB, inflammation, all of the other things, insulin sensitivity, even if you want it to be really rigorous, women still get less heart disease than men. And after you've normalized for blood pressure, smoking, and, and really all of the major factors, you'd have to look at iron levels as a next interesting concept, right? So there's pretty interesting data in men that 
the more metabolically deranged they are, the better they do with therapeutic phlebotomy. Whereas the less metabolically deranged they are, the, the less of an effect they have by giving blood, reducing the oxidative stress of iron. Um, so it, it might be the case that somewhere buried within there is this idea that because for a great number of years of a woman's life, she is going to have less iron than a man due to her menstrual cycle, that may actually um, offer a protective benefit against heart disease. Again, something I would be interested to, to know if that's, certainly people have speculated that, but again, I, I don't know how, how rigorously it's been documented. And we have another thing out there that's lingering, and you're talking to Richard Isaacson very soon, actually. He'll probably have more insight into this, which is if you look at Alzheimer's disease and you look at the prevalence, I think it's two out of every three cases are women. And so two out of every three cases of Alzheimer's are women. And you could probably say that age is a factor. Longevity may be a factor and things like that. Um, but I think that that needs to be studied more too. Yeah. Uh, um, cause I have a hard time believing that that is purely an age issue. I, I don't yeah. think that the, um, increase in longevity of a woman can affect that much of a gap in, um, and, and again, it would be a great discussion with Richard. You're right, because you want to make sure that you're not being fooled by, you know, a diagnostic dis distinction and things like that as well.